Just in case you haven't heard, there's a new Ultraman film on the way called Shin Ultraman and it's from the same creative team behind 2016's Shin Godzilla, Hideaki Anno and Shinji Higuchi. Anno is of course best known for Evangelion and Higuchi is probably best known as the special effects wizard behind the 1990s Gamera trilogy. Unlike Shin Godzilla, where the two shared directing duties. Higuchi has sole directing credit for Shin Ultraman, but don't worry, Anno is attached as writer and producer. These men did great things with Godzilla and, in Higuchi's case, Gamera. Now they will put their spin on Ultraman. Sounds pretty exciting, right? But this isn't the first time Hideaki Anno has worked on an Ultraman project. Before reviving a fallen franchise in the mid-2010s, before changing the landscape of anime in the mid-90s, before introducing the Ganex pose in the late 80s, and before winning the affections of Hayao Miyazaki in the mid-80s with this amazing scene, Anno directed and starred in the 1983 fan film, Return of Ultraman. This story begins back in the early 1980s with a group of university students who called themselves Daikon Film. Daikon Film produced live action and animated content to promote science fiction conventions. Why does this matter? Because Daikon would eventually become Gainax, and his future greatness was evident from the start. The efforts of these passionate and talented young adults would years later result in titles like Royal Space Force, Nadia, Secret of the Blue Water, Gunbuster, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Guren Lagann. And while today Gainax is for all intents and purposes dead, its legacy continues through Studio Kara and Studio Trigger. But the output of Proto Gynex is equally fascinating. Many of you are probably somewhat familiar with the legendary opening animation for the 1983 Daikon 4 convention. It's a finely crafted short set to ELO music and loaded with pop culture references near and dear to the hearts of its young animators. But it's also a copyright nightmare and unsurprisingly has yet to see an official home video release. There's also 1985's Orochi Strikes Again, a theatrically released film that served as the special effects debut of a 20-year-old Shinji Higuchi. But as stated before, the Daikon film production we'll focus on in this video is Return of Ultraman. Even if you aren't interested in Ultraman or giant monsters, this fan film is worth checking out. One reason is that, like the other Daikon film productions, Return of Ultraman has people working on it who would later make a big splash in the entertainment industry. Let's see, Return of Ultraman was written by otaku scholar Toshio Okada, its special effects were handled by Takami Akai, the creator of the Princess Maker game series, and of course, the short was directed by Hideaki Anno. Yep, that's a young Anno, happy as can be almost a decade before his infamous crippling depression, and Return of Ultraman was to be his live action directorial debut. He made a more primitive tribute simply titled Ultraman back in 1980. Unfortunately, tracking down substantial info or finding more than a few seconds of video was quite the challenge. But it was recreated for an episode of Blue Blazes, a comedy series about the university exploits of the future Gynax boys and other industry giants. Anyway, although to my understanding it didn't have much of a narrative, Okada considers the Daikon film Ultraman to be something of a sequel to the earlier project. But I guess that will be a story for another time. Conceptually, Return of Ultraman treats itself like a Matt-centric episode of the television series from which it derives its name. What helps to sell the experience is the use of music and sound effects from the Ultra series. But while the Daikon fan film is a love letter to the original Return of Ultraman television series, it also looks to other places for inspiration. For example, the Matt of this universe does not don the signature orange jumpsuits from the television series. Instead, they sport uniforms that are a cross between those worn by the Ultra Guard from Ultra 7 and Earth Federation forces from Mobile Suit Gundam. In another nod to Ultra 7, glasses are used to transform into Ultraman and even the transformation sequence resembles the one from Ultra 7. The opening credits, which is a montage of matte vehicles preparing for takeoff, draws more from Ultraman Taro's opening credits than the character silhouettes that dominate the openings of the other early Ultra shows. Additionally, the fan film uses Fight Ultraman as its opening theme. Fight Ultraman was at one point meant to be the theme song of the 1971 TV series before being rejected for the song we now associate with Return of Ultraman. Nevertheless, Fight Ultraman is an excellent song and is put to great use here.
A more significant difference is in the characters. While they are functionally the same, only Captain Ibuki is carried over from the original series and he has little in common with his namesake aside from his position as leader. For example, with his stoic personality and fondness for dark shades, this version of Captain Ibuki seems like a rough draft of Gendo Akari. He also has an adult son who's a member of the defense team and it plays an important role in the story. Speaking of which, let's get to the story. Daikon Films' Return of Ultraman revolves around Matt's race against time to defeat the Bug Jewel monster. Of course there is the strategizing that fans of the Ultra series and fans of Anno will recognize, though the most interesting bit is the moral dilemma that arises once conventional weapons fail to stop the beast. <laughs> Despite the risk of significant collateral damage, Matt is ordered by its parent organization to use nukes. This is where the line is drawn in the sand. On one side there's Hayakawa, the Ultraman of this short film. Hayakawa has reservations about bombing even before nukes are brought into the equation because of the thousands of survivors in the city ruins. He also seems to be familiar with the monster and doubts that a nuke will work against it. Eventually his concern about the human cost drives him to defying orders and he has to stand alone for what he believes in like Rondo Yaguchi would do later in Shin Godzilla, where a nuke was also an important factor in the plot. Hayakawa takes a moment to pause and reflect on the destruction left in the wake of the monster and the battles waged against it. This and more demonstrates how much Ultraman has come to love Earthlings and it's an incredibly faithful character bit. <laughs> On the other hand, the other members of Met are more willing to follow instructions. Most of all, Captain Ibuki. For him, the situation is personal since his son is believed to have been killed during an earlier attack Matt made on the monster. While it's clear Captain Ibuki has conflicting feelings and he might be allowing a thirst for revenge to cloud his judgment, the nuke does seem like it might be the only means to resolve the conflict. And instead of giving the unpleasant responsibility to one of his subordinates, he handles it himself. In all fairness, wanting to bring the crisis to a swift end is an understandable position seeing how the entire situation had been a costly one from the start. Within the opening minutes of the short film, a serene morning is brought to a dramatic end for a little girl and countless others within the Hiratsune city limits. They all become victims of the Bug Jewel monster's devastating arrival in a meteorite and the grim reality is not shied away from. In these ways, Return of Ultraman has a thoughtfulness surprisingly uncommon for the films of this genre. Often such matters are overlooked for the sake of spectacle. As mentioned earlier, if for nothing else, Return of Ultraman is worth watching just to see where Hideaki Anno got his start. Along with seeing the earliest examples of Anno's infatuation with telephone poles and quick cuts, Return of Ultraman is where the debt owed to Akiyoji Soji and by extension the Ultra series is most evident. Notice the signature low angles and close-ups, the unique shot compositions, and the experimentation with light and shadows. But there's also the use of flashing screens to emphasize tension and other reoccurring tricks that would later dominate Neon Genesis Evangelion and Anno's other projects. Even Anno's taste for classical music can be found here. But let's get to the special effects, the hero, and the monster. Nothing sells the significance of the special effects accomplishments here more than looking at the behind the scenes footage. There was so much that could have gone wrong, but it went so so right. Take something like this for example. Pretty unflattering, right? Just some scattered models and dudes fumbling around in costumes. But some inspired composition, lighting, and editing later, and boom, magic. The Daikon boys successfully emulate the highly stylized action and visuals of Subaraya Productions. Low angle photography to sell the costume men as giants, foregrounds filled with detailed miniatures, and high speed photography to convey a sense of mass. Now onto Ultraman himself, and played by Hideaki Anno. Anno wears a custom jersey, color timer, and everyday jeans and tennis shoes. Between that and Anno maintaining an emotionless demeanor meant to mimic the inexpressive face of Ultraman is a priceless sight that almost sounds like it belongs in a parody. But through the combination of Anno's commitment to the role, the authentic Ultra sounds, and the film treating it as ordinary reality, it works. Ultraman has all of his usual tricks and tools like the beam weapons, flight, and the Ultra Bracelet. A watch substitutes for the Ultra Bracelet and is how Ultraman eventually overpowers the Bug Jewel monster's defenses. And the Bug Jewel monster is no pushover. Between its destructive arrival and Hayakawa's concerns that it might be the infamous space demon not even Ultraman could defeat, the monster is established as a force to be reckoned with, long before the viewer truly sees it in action and it's an impressive invention. With its insect-like features and monochrome color scheme, it seems like a Legion prototype, albeit brought to life in the traditional managed suit, dinosaurian manner. 
Like many of the monsters in Anno the Future work, this is a lumbering behemoth. There's not much in the way of movement or expression, though it's restraint I've come to prefer in the giant monster media I consume. The Bug Jewel monster also boasts a force field that shields it from virtually everything thrown its way. Perhaps a tribute to the shields of Zeton in the last episode of the original Ultraman television series, and a early draft of the AT fields from Neon Genesis Evangelion. The final battle between Ultraman and the Bug Jewel monster is an entertaining showdown. The monster quickly puts Ultraman on the ropes, and all hope seems lost until Ultraman gets in a lucky shot. From there he shatters the monster's barrier, and then proceeds to punish the destructive menace. The turning tide of the fight is accompanied by the main theme, and it perfectly sets the mood that leads up to a roundhouse kick and Ultraman blowing his opponent away in an impressive explosion. It's also satisfying to watch and is one of my favorite ultra battles thus far. For it being made by a bunch of amateurs working on one of their first serious projects, there's a lot to admire about Return of Ultraman. Inspired camera work, thrilling effects, and an ambitious narrative. It's both an entertaining fan film and wonderful tribute to the Ultra series that teases the talent waiting to be fully unleashed. That brings us back to Shin Ultraman, which represents Anno returning to his roots. It should be interesting to see what he'll do with more money at his disposal and experience under his belt. And I'm curious to see what influence Return of Ultraman might have on this new project. Now that Anno has apparently finished with Evangelion, we seem to be entering an exciting new phase of his career where he's being given the keys to all of his favorite childhood properties. He's set to direct 2023's Shin Kamen Rider and has joked about Shin Gamera. We'll have to wait to see what the future holds, but in the meantime, it wouldn't hurt to see how he got his start. It just might say something about where he's heading.